Why can't women lead? I'm sorry. I fully I mean, agree with you. Why can't we be the dominant species? I, I literally tell them, the handbag you just bought yeah, last exactly. week was more it's expensive. More All of a sudden, this whole Asian market opened up for me. Look at the gender problem, the race problem. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at the ability. I see so many women are using this venture capital money to drive the societal change that they want to see. Hello, welcome to the Pearl Lamb podcast. Today, I want to introduce Mackie Doyer. Mackie, would you please give a brief about yourself? Brief, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Mackie Doyer. I was born in the Netherlands. Um, an absolute number girl. I really love numbers, can't help it. Uh, studied math, uh, worked at the big four in mergers and acquisitions, uh, but quickly realized, right, I was, as a consultant, I was writing a lot of business plans. I quickly learned, like, writing a business plan is not saving the world. Um, so I stepped out, and uh, together with a colleague, we built the company Business Models Inc., uh, the company behind the famous uh, Business Model Generation book, and in that role, it led me to expand the company globally. And I got the opportunity to move to the United States, to San Francisco. Um, so I moved there um, and built the company further into the US. Uh, worked there with corporates, with startups, um, started my own personal angel investing journey. Uh, and then after five years there, I decided to do an exit. And that's what had me move to Singapore. And when I landed in Singapore, um, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to continue doing was angel investing. And that led me to uh, start Epic Angels, a female angel uh, investor collective. I knew two things. Education is a big thing for me. I mean, that's what I was always doing in the U.S. And the other part was angel investing. I started to do that in San Francisco, right? Because it's when you live in Silicon Valley, Yes, it's of hard course. not to. And especially right. if you're advising all the companies for innovation. You're in the middle of it. I mean, of course you will invest because you will be looking at all these opportunities. And it's also not that something special. It's like, like getting a coffee, right? Yeah. It's just very mainstream. I mean, it's, it's nothing special. So when I got here and then opened an you know, all of a sudden this whole Asian market opened up for me because I was new to Asia. I mean, I traveled there for, for vacation and uh, I had a team in Taiwan actually. So I, I've done a few things here and there, but not really. So this whole market opened up and I saw all these opportunities. So like, I, I want to continue my angel investing journey. But I mean, I knocked on the door of a couple of uh, collectives that are here, but they were all very old school. Um, a lot of men, right? Um, it was very traditional, but also old school, right? I mean, and, and I was like, I don't like this. So I said to three, I, I met three women here in Singapore and I said to them, you know what? Shall we just do it with the four of us? Uh, I know my way around in startup land. I'll find us a startup and we'll see if we want to invest. And they're like, okay, good, let's do it. Literally six weeks later, we did our very first investment. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, yeah, so that was what quickly happened was um, of more women started to knock on our door. Not a big surprise, right? But what really was the surprising part, startups knocked on our door as well. They were like, you're women. We need female investors. We need women on our cap table because we only have men as investors. We need female investors. Can you invest in us? I mean, we were just four women, so we didn't have that much money, right? So no, we couldn't. And then after a few months, we're like, okay, what happens if we add one more lady to the mix, right? When I were five, let's see if that works. And I mean, I, I had some extra time at hand. So by November in that year, I was together with another lady, Hester, my business partner now for Epic Angels. We were like, you know what? Let's just do this for real, right? I mean, I have the time, I have the bandwidth. Let's open our doors and see if we can really build a community here. And that's what we did. That and was how two long years does it, ago. I mean, how long you took to build this big community? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we opened our doors November two about two years ago. Uh, right now, about two hundred and seventy female investors in twenty five different countries all over the world, uh, but How investing exciting. in Asia, in Southeast Asia or Asia, a, a whole of Asia Pacific. <laughs> wow. So it really ranges from Pakistan to Japan, Australia, China, Southeast Asia. Anything. So when you say startup, what area are you investing? Usually it's in tech um, and any industry. What 
Uh, we have done one non-tech uh, startup. It's Kind Cones, plant-based ice cream. If you're here in Singapore, you should try their ice cream. It's really good. I like <laughs> milk ice cream. Funny enough, try it. Really? I, I would not tell you it's plant-based. You wouldn't know. I cannot even take vegan food. No, I'm, I'm also I'm also an absolutely non-vegan. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really love their really? ice cream. Okay. It's, I had what is the name? Kind Cones. Okay, later on you write it. For yes, me. they have multiple outlets in Singapore. I had their peanut butter jelly one this weekend, which was really good, really, really. So good. you invest yeah. in them. So, so that was the only on one non tech. That was the they only one. They knock on your door, and then you study, you do your analysis, yeah. you do your, you do your numbers. Yes. And then I all know. your ladies follow you. All. No. And all they divide it in different groups. So we are really an angel network, which means every angel decides on her own. So we're not like a VC fund where you just give money to yeah. the to the lead and they invest for you. No, uh, how it works is uh, we curate, we scout and curate. We have partners with many VC companies um, in the region, accelerator programs. So we're trying to scout all the good startups. We see about 100 startups every month, so quite a lot. We curate and about two to four every month are presented to our angels through a pitch night. It's a virtual pitch night. So online, the startups um, present. So are you having fun now? 100%. It's so amazing. It's, I mean, half of the women have done investing before in startups, but at least half has never done it before. They, and I mean, if you want to be an angel investor, you need to have a little bit of extra money, right? Of angel course, investing is super risky. So yeah. you only do that with maybe 5%, um, oh. max 10% of your assets. So you need to have some spare money, which means these women are really top earners, right? They have super senior jobs. But when it comes to investing, completely new. They've never, ever done it. Somehow, you know, they were not thought how to do it. They just, you know but they want to do it, but they just don't know how. So we really help these women to get from zero to one. Like, how do you get started with investing, with angel investing Actually, what you are doing is you're giving confidence. Yes, Because absolutely. when you invest, you have confidence. Whatever you do something new, you need to have yeah, confidence. You have, you have to. to have confidence. You, yeah. have, you are actually grooming. Yes. Grooming that them, giving them confidence. And when they have the first investment and after they have exactly. good return, they make it bigger. It's like, okay, now, now I dare to do this. And it's, it's, it's very funny. We, this courage to invest, it's a big thing, right? I mean, I have these ladies, they earn like easily, like half a million dollar a year, right? So big earners. And our investments already start with only two and a half thousand dollars. So that's nothing, nothing. right? That's, that's peanuts for these women. I, I literally tell them, the handbag you just bought yeah, last exactly. week was more, more expensive, than yeah, right? Than, more than, that. than this yeah. this investment. And still, they struggle to make that investment, which is that confidence, exactly, as it's you said, confidence. right? It's that it's courage to invest. It's confidence. It's yeah. like, it's like when, when you have the person coming in, they want to be an art collector because their friends are art collectors. Yeah, 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 or, yeah. or because socially, you sit down, everybody's talking art. Yeah. They want, but they don't have the confidence to Same buy thing. the first piece yeah. because I think they don't want to lose money. They don't want to do this. And I, you yeah. know, I think it's very different when you talk about investing. Investing is about them making money, but collecting is about your passion. Well, yeah, I think it's actually, feel. it's the same, I feel. I think with I mean, art as well. Everything is about confidence. Because with art, I mean, especially if you're a big art collector, you're also trying to do that for some financial return, right? I mean, but it's, it's, both, I guess. You're doing that because you want to, because you love it, right? You you, you, you have, have to have the passion. But when you talk about, because when in the art world, we don't want to talk about investing in art. Because investing in art immediately turn artworks into commodities. Mm -hmm. That means that if it is a commodities, I know most of the private banker now has asked all the clients to put 10% of whatever yeah. their investment in art. But in the art world itself, we didn't want to have the artwork becomes commodities because it, um, the artist's career will be in risk. Because once, you know, the stock market, when it goes up, it goes down and they can come up again. When the artist's price goes down, it won't go up again. Same with startups. Oh, yeah, of course, startups. Is if the, the same. startup goes down, 
it's out of business. Yeah. Right. So I s- actually see some similarities there because. But it's different because your startup, you can after it goes IPO, it, you can make twenty, thirty, it even hundred really times. Big. Yeah. Times. Sure. Sure. I mean, you can't expect from from an artwork. I mean, it's it's a complete different elements. The elements of an artwork is at least you can enjoy it. Yeah. You can you can feel great because you are actually invested in the artist's career, especially their museum shows, their collections. And whether the value goes up or not, mm-hmm. it should be a bonus point. Yes. I mean, for I mean, if you are doing VC fund, you are the angel investors. My god. When it goes IPO, maybe in 10 years' time, the money can be 100 times. But Yes, and what I see... When, and you when, can lose everything. When, when women invest, um, of course, the financial return, that's something that we're aiming for. But it's also because we can put money where our mouth is and where our heart is. So I see so many women are using this venture capital money to drive the societal change that they want to see. Um, so, so I mean, right now, actually, at this moment, we have two investments live. One is in prosthetic arms based on AI sensors, uh, specifically designed for emerging markets, because so many people in emerging markets don't have as- uh, access to prosthetics. Amazing, beautiful, right? What this company, what an impact this company makes. And at the same time, it's a great business, right? They really have a good business model behind it. They're great founders that can make it happen. So you're going in for the financial return, but at the same time, you're like, okay, if this goes south, I don't care. I contributed to a real good cause, right? There should it's be more emotions. of this. Emotions. The there is. It is emotions. emotional as well. It's so important. Because I thought when you do investment, you should never have emotions. It should be yeah. rationale. It should be numbers. Whether you go to kill it or not is about numbers. Uh, then I'm not sure if angel investing is the right asset class if you go in purely for the numbers. Some some people might do that. Um, but I think you need to have something extra as well. You need to have a passion for it. If you're purely doing it for the financial return, I'm... I would maybe suggest go for real estate or go for some of the more safer asset classes. Because I think a lot of people, when they do do a VC fund or and you know, or whatever, they because they just want to have this great return, mm-hmm. and also they want to, if they believe in a in a company, in believe in the products, they want to be in control and they want to be in the management. They, you know, there's a lot of. You know, the VC fund always have this. But that's, that's I think, that's already a bit further out, right? I mean, that is that is indeed... You have to wait. Th- that is what I see a lot in the more traditional way of angel investing. People are putting half a million dollar into a startup. And when they do that, they expect a seat at the table. Yes. Uh, that is a bit for me the old school angel investing. That is indeed and what you see a lot is these older men, right? They're retired. They have some good money left and they still want to be, you know, uh, be on that board and, and, and uh, call the shots. Um, the new type of angel investor is way more about like two and a half thousand dollars. Well, for two and a half thousand dollars, you're not going to get a no, seat at no, the table. No, 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 no. We still love to be on the board. As sometimes we are, even though our um, the amount that we invested is relatively small. We maybe I mean the largest we've done so far is two and a thousand dollars as a group, which is significant, right? It's good, uh, but. Still, the, 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 the startups are saying, we want you on our board, right? Because we need a woman on our board. No matter if you invested 100K as a group, right? Whether someone else put a million in there, we want you because we need a woman on our board, right? And, and that's fun. I think that's great. What do you think about, you know, when you have all these women doing angel investors, are you talking about feminism? Are you talking about, you know? In the 1970s, all the women has to go out and they have to, of equality of the man. Are you talking about that? No. I mean, I I honestly, I loaded all that stuff in the past. You know, when, when I was working with the big corporates as well, there's all these women groups and whatnot. I always avoided that. I mean, everything all of a sudden turns, turns pink. Um, uh, I mean, I studied math. In my whole class, there were four ladies, right? And the rest were all guys. I never even saw that as weird or yeah. different. I never yeah. felt myself different, I right? Yeah. I mean, I'm just one of the guys, right? One of 
just the people that study math, right? And and it has nothing to do with being a boy or a girl. I mean, that's that's irrelevant in my opinion. Um, so it's really hilarious that I started this all women group now. <laughs> that's just really super funny how that ended up. I mean, I I don't like like look at us women, right? I mean, and and because it feels it's more from a victim perspective when that's done. And I really believe more in women as change makers and from the strength. And and that's what I want but to I emphasize. But I think feminism came out as a reaction about women being suppressed. Mm -hmm. We are talking yeah. about that in 1960s and 70s. Yeah. I remember I did, I think it was a BBC or radio or whatever, but they were asking me whether I have been discriminated um, as a woman mm -hmm. in the in the art world, and I said absolutely not. And I said, uh, and I said I don't even feel that there is this gender difference. I actually thought that the woman leads more than more than you know anything. I don't see man or I mean man or woman. I think we have to talk about ability. Yes, and I mean it is. Well, there's a lot of talk as well in the VC world about female founders, how female founders are not getting the money that they should get, right? How only uh, like two, three percent of the money actually goes to these uh, to these female founders. But and, and what people have been trying to do for the past 10 years, they've been trying to convince men like you have to invest in women um, and it just doesn't work. And my firm belief is, we st well, keep on doing that, but I'm not doing that. What I really believe in, we need to get more female investors. And that will solve a lot of things. Because when you get in, because women, you know, they're going to put the money where their heart is, where they really believe the change can be made. Whether it's a man or a woman that we're investing in. As Epic Angels, we invest in both men and women. Although we did say if it's a male founder, we need to see a female uh, um, leadership as well, like one of the C-level people needs to be a woman as well, but doesn't have to be the founder. Male founder is fine as well. Um, and it's all about women as change makers, because if you're making this investment, right, so you're this for everyone. Startup investing is high uncertainty. You really have no clue what's going to happen with this company, what's going what's gonna to be there. So looking at all those elements, you try to hold on on that little bit of certainty that you can find. And that's human nature, unfortunately, right? Where the men are sort of holding on to, oh, that's a male founder. At least I recognize that a little bit more. It gives me certainty. It's based on, it's not correct. I just but that's read what happens. in the newspaper, the biggest angel investor in China is a lady. And it's run by this lady. I mean, it's, run, yeah. I mean, it's a very young uh, woman who runs this firm. I forgot this firm. It's about angel investor, of course. In China, there's a lot of startup. Yes. It's a complete different yes. category. But, I mean, we are talking about um, confidence, mm -hmm. I think. These, I mean, a younger generation of women, they are much more confident than the generation still fighting for feminism yes. and all that. I think the world is changing. Yes. I mean, today we have paternal leave. You wouldn't even heard, heard about it, I mean, 30, 40 years ago. So I think this changes, which really give women a platform. But you know, in the art world, a woman, a woman artist price is still substantially lower than, and than men. I remember uh, one of the artists, Jenny Horso, we were talking about it and they were saying that a woman prices is like 10% or 20% no. of, of, men, of men prices. But however, the art world in the West now, they are offering all the platform for women artists. So women artists has much more, uh, much more opportunities. But when we look at equality, it's, uh, come on, it's really, it's, yes. can the world be the have opposite. equality? I mean, this is something that we were fighting for, looking for, but in reality, will that really happen? It's a tough one. I, mean, so I always struggle with that, right? This is why, as you said, there's why this... Why can't women lead? I'm sorry. Yeah. Why are we looking for equality? No, I, I fully I mean, agree with you. Why can't we be the dominant species? And at the same time, you're saying, okay, so it's only 10%, right, of, oh. of the value of, the, of, oh. the, of the, the male equivalent, which is also not what it should be, right? So, how, like, is, but is that something that needs to be fixed? Or are we saying... I mean, that? I think today... the. Uh, I, 
I feel the biggest problem of today is you look at the gender problem, the race problem. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at the ability. Yeah, yeah. I rather, I think, in order to be fair, we don't care the gender, we don't care the color. We look at people's ability. That ability should be the calling card. That's the only thing that really matters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I, now I think in the world, not everywhere in Asia, but it's, it's a better platform for women to excel because there are countries that are just visited. Um, I was told that the women and men's pay, pay are still not, not of equal, and these are really developed. De yeah. It's not developing, it's developed mm -hmm. economy. So it was really pretty. That I mean, the equality of the world is actually there's no there's no equality. I always say to a lot of a lot of my ladies' friends or a younger generation of girls, and I said, why don't fight for equality? No. Fight for woman lead. Yeah, no, if I you just, want to fight, be the dominant species. Yeah, no, do it yourself, right? I, I, yeah. I fully agree with you, right? I mean, I, I, I never understood that. Um, I mean, I'm, I grew up indeed in my education as well, just surrounded yeah. by boys, and that's it. And you just got to make sure you, you know, you're, you're the best one and you're standing out, but it's about you and not whether you're a woman or Absolutely. not. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Next question I want to ask you is, tell me about your book, your four million copies that you sold about this book yeah so the business model generation book um uh, with the business models in company that um that i was part of we are the producer of the book um and and uh, alex osterwaller he's the he's the guy who did a phd about it he's the author about it um and it basically is all about stop writing business plans because business plans are completely useless uh, by the time the ink is dry, the world changed again, Absolutely. right? And no business plan ever survives the first customer contact. So, uh, but but you have to go through certain thinking steps uh, if you are if you want to run a business. You need to strategically think about that. So this framework in that book is this one pager, the business model canvas. That on a one pager helps you to answer your strategic questions, like how am I going to create, deliver, and capture value for my customers? Because that's in the end what it is about. And since it's a one pager, you can literally, it's like art, you put it up on the wall uh, and you can look at it and you can change it and you can make multiple versions of it instead of a business plan. You can't make multiple versions of a business plan. That doesn't work, right? It's too much work. Uh, usually you have a business plan because your bank wants it. Because your bank your, wants it. Yeah. yeah. Completely useless. Yeah. And all yeah. these institutional ones are, who wants a business plan. Yeah. I no. always thought that it's a complete waste of time. 100%. I mean, it's just to 100%. show and just to get something and you never use it. You, and you haven't adapted. Yeah, and, but, you have, but you do need to go through the strategic thinking, though. Of course. And you do need to have that vision. But what I also believe in is that you should remain flexible when you do a business because oh. you have certain assumptions. You think, okay, if I'm going to roll this out, this is what's going to happen. But your reality usually is different. <laughs> You're like, oh, I thought this would happen. Now it turned out the other thing happens. Okay, great. How does that change my business, right? And if you do that with the business model canvas, you can literally do it with post-its like, hey, hold on. Or even, I mean, I always use the COVID example. Everyone who had an in-person uh, store, they had to change online, right? And you, can't, you can open a website, but that doesn't change your business right away. You have to think different. And, and where was it, it published in Netherlands or in where? So yeah, in the, in the Netherlands, and it reproduced it. Um, uh, and now it's with Wiley, the, the publisher. Uh, so uh, they took over the rights of the book. Uh, Is this they led were... you to become a professor? Uh, yes, that definitely helped. I mean, I was always doing lectures and education. Uh, and then with the Business Model Canvas, luckily in many universities right now, it's it's stable, right? It's it's when, within every curriculum that the students are learning about the Business Model Canvas and using that as an alternative as so well. So how did this bring you into design? So the design of business for me, right? Mm. I mean, it was also... Um, so when I arrived here, so the Business Model Canvas, since it is a design thinking tool, um, and uh, what out of the box thinking, yes, and it's about creating options for me. Design thinking is about creating options. So, um, 
uh, this this book brought me all over the world. Also, a couple of years ago, already into Singapore, uh, and then I met with Design Singapore. Um, and so, Design yeah. Singapore is a council here run by EDB, the Economic Development yeah. Boards, uh, basically the ones that define what happens in Singapore. Uh, and Design Singapore is all about like make Singapore a lovable nation by design, and design in a very broad manner. Uh, and when I moved here, they were like we need you on our board as well. So uh, so I joined uh, the board of uh, Design Singapore also, really to look at the design from a business perspective. So really the design of business angle, which is, uh, which is my angle in there. So how do you see the future of Singapore business based in your design more business model? I think what uh, in general in Singapore, um, and it's, it's moving forward, but I think what could be more is that thinking in options. Because Singapore is, it's a tiny country, right? It's like five and a half million people. Um, it's relatively easier to say, okay, this is the way we're gonna do it and it's we're all gonna do it. Me. Yeah, and the government is, I mean, I, I find it amazing how the government, government runs this country. I think it's fascinating, right? It's really run as a business. Uh, I, I really admire that. Uh, they, they throw a lot of effort, money in a certain direction if they want to move into a direction. I love how that brings the country forward because, I mean, Singapore is doing extremely well. However, the downside of that has been that many people within the country they just follow what the government tells them to do. But this is our Chinese culture. Yeah. This is the Confucius culture to ask you to comply and obey. Yeah. Don't and you think, don't even question. You are not, yeah, you're not trained most of the countries in Asia, even in yeah. America. They, I mean, the whole education system is to manufacture robots. Yes. I mean, you want people that to say to yes. You don't want you to have people to think outside because you don't want one uh, counter re revolution. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you don't want rebellion. And I'm from Europe, where we just go and strike every time something happens, right? Yeah. Because we don't agree. I mean, here you can't strike and you cannot have protest. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You, you cannot. Do, but you, you don't even consider it. I mean, one of one of my best friends, uh, Kelly, she's a Singaporean, and I always have these amazing conversations with her. And I'm like, Kelly, wh why are people actually just doing it? And then she's like. Good question. I never considered you actually could say no, right? Because that's not how we grew up. And I love yeah, having those conversations think, with her about I that. I think the problem, I mean, I wouldn't say the problem, is our culture. We have a very, we are very ingrained in our culture, even though we think that Confucius is a little bit backdated. But remember, I mean, recently, Chinese government is still building Confucius Institute all over the world. Yeah. And Confucius' philosophy is a direct contradiction to democracy. Yes. And then uh, a thinking freely, being liberal is completely different. So it's very hard, not just in Singapore. I think most of the um, Asian countries, I think Hong Kong is better, mm -hmm. um, that you doubt, you think, you don't comply. It's about And you thinking. think out of, I mean, you don't, you just don't follow. Yeah, and, and I think it's also about allowing people to fail. Um, and because as, I've also- But it's our education system. No, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Mean, it's the education system that, although they teach you about free thinking, yeah. but they don't lead you to have a free thinking. Whenever you have a free thinking, they give you this judgmental attitude. So it's very yeah. difficult. Cool. And I always say that because when we talk about design as yeah. design, right? To be innovative, to be able to design, you have to be free. Yes. Free thinking, no boundaries, n nothing. Because I was really impressed when I went to Design Academy, yeah. um, I Hoven, where I see different classes, you know, one is doing textile, one is doing building, one is doing, doing fact, no walls yeah. between them. I mean, it was just different lectures because it's about cross-discipline. You have to think in a, in a very multilateral way. And do things different. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I thought that was, uh, I was completely stunned yeah. by that. Um, it's very difficult in Asia because 
the Confucius culture yeah. is very ingrained in not just in uh, China. Actually, is the least, but is that is that com compliance, that obedience is still there. But it's in I mean, that culture, is, that philosophy is very strong in Japan, Korea, yes. Yes. and all over. Yes. So it's very hard to ask people to not to follow because the, at first the government won't like it. We need more uh, rebel girls, right? We need more people who dare to go against the status quo, and not because they want to rebel, but really because like, hey, just asking that question, why am I doing the things I'm doing it or what, that are being told to me? There's actually a different way of doing it as well. And it's not about is, right or wrong. If you're in an education system that do not encourage you to question. Yeah. So it's very difficult in the future, how can you question? Because it's a conditioning. But it's changing, luckily. I mean, I've, even I've been... Like, I mean, my... if you're changing, it's only changing by experience. When yes, you start no, wor sure. working with... I think a lot of my friends are changing because they start working with the different companies or going abroad that teach them how to think outside the box. Yes. And, but also, um, I think an environment that puts fear in you, the fearfulness yeah. also won't give you that but fear is always everywhere. I mean, I, I, I remember when we first moved to San Francisco, people were like, wow, that's so brave, right? And, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, I didn't even consider it brave. It was like, oh, no, fun, Because right? you it's, are adventurous. Yeah, Not everybody I, I love is the it. same. And it's, um, you know, but you, you have to just try different things. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? That you go back? That's it, right? I mean... Nothing waste of happen. time. Time, yeah, but you loss of time, but you gain experience. You experience is something that makes what we are today, and that's the most valuable thing. Yes, I mean, moving countries for me is the best thing that happened. Right, living, living, lived in the Netherlands, lived in the U.S., um, now living here, um, and it's. It's fine. I find it so fascinating to see all the different cultures, and I learn so much about that. I don't agree with everything, but it's not about agreeing. It's just about understanding. And you also learn so much more about you, because even though I think in the Netherlands in general, we're pretty liberal and, and open-minded. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're also a bit constricted in a way. And I only saw that when I was living in the US and, and living in Singapore, as even from Singapore, because sometimes you don't even realize that you're doing things in a certain structure, but only by stepping out of the structure, you're like, oh, yeah. you can do it in a different way as well. That's fun. Mackie, quick question. What makes a good uh, entrepreneur? Now, this is interesting. Uh, we spoke a lot about like dare to do things different. And I think for me, that's what an entrepreneur is also about. Like, what would you consider? What? How yeah. would you define entrepreneur first? I had a whole philosophical evening once about that question, <laughs> so that's a very tough one. But an entrepreneur is some someone who, um, who who runs a business in the end, right? But I mean, are you a startup entrepreneur when you do that? When your mama pops up, maybe not, right? There's different types of entrepreneurs for sure. Uh, but for me, that entrepreneur is like, hey, I'm just going to earn my own money um, and then probably and hopefully build a business around that. What makes a good entrepreneur for me? I mean, what we always say is like we we invest in founders who refuse to die, um, <laughs> but at the same time who choose agility over ego. And I think yes, that that, yes, that, that combination is, very, very is critical, right? Because refuse to die, I mean, as a startup entrepreneur, you get hit in the face every week, right? You just hit a wall or someone hits you or whatever. You have to get up, right? You have to get up and fight. You're like, that didn't work. Shoot, how do I get around this wall? Do I get on top of it? Do I go underneath? Do I go on the side? Do I need other people to tackle that wall? You have to be super creative constantly because every single week, new issues are thrown at you. Of course. Right? And you just have to be able to deal with that. So that's that um, refuse to die. Like I'm going to climb that wall no matter what. But agility over... Determination. Right, really, really determined. And at the same time, that's agility over ego. Because sometimes Absolutely. I see people are like, my product is the best thing in the world. And I'm like, might be, but 
who needs your product, right? I mean, who's waiting for that? You have to be super focused on your customer and really constantly being in touch with them. I, mean, I spoke with a, with a startup founder yesterday and, and he was like, yeah, I'm going to launch uh, end, of, uh, end of February, six weeks from now. And I said, why not launch this week? Yeah, but we still need to do this and this and this. I said, yeah, but your product is never done. Right, you need to launch now. I mean, this is a famous quote from Silicon Valley, from uh, from from Reid Hoffman. If you're not embarrassed by your first product launch, you've launched too late. Mm. And I really love that. Right, like yeah, it's shitty that first thing that you put out in the market, but you need to get feedback. You need to get constant customer feedback to get better. Yeah, right? to improve. And, yeah, and that's that mindset for me that an entrepreneur needs. Very interesting because I always felt that, you know, what pull an entrepreneur back is ego. Yeah. Is yeah. ego. Is, yeah. is, and also, I think entrepreneur has to be fearless and has to be open-minded. Yes. The open-mindedness is very important. That you have to accept, continuous accepting new and new things coming in because nice. any new things come in, it... It evolved, it changed your whole business model. Yes. So I thought this, these are all the all the very important ingredients. And at the same time, staying true to your, of course. your vision, right? Yeah, your vision is very important. Because most of the people, I know a lot of people who doesn't have vision. No. I mean, they like to follow because they want to be very safe. Yes. So obviously, an entrepreneur has to have that confidence to break boundaries. Yeah. Just like... I mean, that is funny. So I lived in Europe, um, in the U.S. and in the, in Singapore now. When we were asking, you were asking at first the startup scene in the Netherlands. Yeah. And I was like, it's not really there. Well, in my opinion, in Europe, I mean, I'm exaggerated, but in general, Europe is retired, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, people, the life in Europe is almost too good. Everyone, I think, I think after you move to America, you will never return to live in Europe. <laughs> Probably not. No, no. So because I mean, everyone has a real good life. Um, and there's a lot of lot of equality, actually, right? The disparity yes. isn't as yes. big in Europe as it is yes. in, in, uh, Europe, in the US. Yeah, more equality than in America yeah. at any time. But that also means people don't have the guts to start no, something I completely think new. Because I I actually be, uh, think that because of the government, because of the social system. Because when your social system taking care of everything, yes, thing, then <clears throat> you don't have this um, this push. No, there's to, no sense of urgency. Um, yeah, this urgency or the push to up the quality of your life because your quality of your life is there, and then you pay your tax. They give you all the base good social cruising. system. Just cruising. And also, no. it doesn't encourage you to be ambitious. No, no, please, no. And I find a lot of European system is they have a discrimination against wealth. Yes. Oh, yes. And it's also socially not very yeah. accepted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, people, you know, like, no, 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 we don't like that. Just, just, just be normal. Yeah. Tell, tell me more about your newest in investment in all these cities, I mean, all these countries like Pakistan and... Yeah. Pakistan is a fascinating one. I know. I We're know. actually, the, I think the growth is pretty. It's the fifth largest country in the mm. world. Uh, and it's a country we don't hear a lot about in general. Um, but the women there are a whole other league. I don't know what it is, uh, but we did two investments and we're closing the third one right now in Pakistan. Um, I, I remember on your show, you also had this Pakistani lady, yes, right, the chef. Uh, Sarah, Sarah did this fair cafe I still have to visit. I mean, when I was listening to her, I was like, oh yeah, she got that same fire, right? I, I it's think, just amazing. I think it's amazing is because of her parents. Because I, you know, when you read about Pakistan, when you learn about Pakistan, it's always, I always felt that it was such a male-dominated countries that girls are not allowed to study. Mm. But then she has these fascinating, fabulous parents who are all academics and they push the children. Yeah, and it's, I think... Three daughters, yeah. Yeah, luckily there's a lot of uh, education they can get outside of the country as well. As so so there's some opportunity there so that they can see different things. But at least the parents allow the yeah. daughters to go abroad to study because what True. you read and what is happening, I think that only comes to, to upper middle 
class family. Because when you to talk about the working class, you, there's still a lot of illiterate there. I speak with a lot of female entrepreneurs mm, in mm, Pakistan. Mm, mm, mm. And what is so shocking to me, some of them are like, they're these kick-ass women, right? They run these companies, good businesses. If they want to go to a business meeting in the evening, they still have to ask permission to their No! Husband. Yes. Wow! And... And wow. no, it's and it for me. It, 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 it was like what, like what's what's happening here? And the funny part is that it is sort of that social system. And even saying like, I, my husband will never say no to me, right? I know that that's happening, but still, you sort of have to go through that motion. And what I see there is sort of this really smart thinking that these women have. Like, okay, I just you know, gonna do this manipulate helping is yeah, how I like to call it. Yeah, because it's a survival it. thing. It is because a survival thing. Survival thing in order for them to get the freedom, and they know what they know how to get it, and that's the that's the fun I mean, thing I mean, that I mean, if you're put in that surrounding, you have you to have, know. You have not have every, to well, know. the majority just complies. Huh? But there are a couple of women that really are coming from that suppression, and then are like, I'm gonna get what I want, right? And I'm going to play it smart. When you move to New York, are you yes. going to expand your your female angel investors? Yes. The, actually, last year, the U.S. Uh, investors was the largest growing group um, of our uh, collective, which is very interesting. There's a lot of specifically Asian Americans in the U.S. that either were born in the U.S. or um, uh, or are there just moved there together with their parents on a younger age. Um, but in the U.S., people um, are a lot focused on the U.S., right? Not so much outside of, of the course, borders. Of course, it's always. It's so, always. Uh, so when you look at the investment landscape, there's a lot of investment opportunities within the U.S., but not so much outside. So if you are living in the U.S. and you want to diversify your portfolio and include Asia, which is, I mean, the GDP growth is going to come from Asia in the next couple of years. So if you want to invest there, it's hard to find those opportunities. So that's what we're offering to the women in the U.S. as well, to expand your portfolio into the uh, Asia-Pacific region. Very interesting. Yeah, so that's going to be very fun. For all the viewers, I, please give a tip. How to build courage to invest? How to build that courage to invest? Well, or how first, to build courage in general? Stop analysis paralysis. <laughs> that's, that's for sure and start moving with super tiny baby steps, right? I mean, don't make a big jump right away. That is too much. But start start small, and from there, you can grow, right? But start, that's that most important thing. And what's that for you, Pro? Um, if you think about what gives, how to get more confidence? I think confidence is, I mean, I always say to um, a lot of young young kids, to conquer the world, you have to have confidence. Confidence is you need to achieve. So achieving these things, small step by small step, like when you get good marks in your examination, you be, become more confident. When you are start working, when you do small jobs, when you do it well, you get compliments, you get confidence. So it is building. So you are building yourself, but you have to take risk. Take the risk. That's you have the key to thing. Take you risk. have to. You if have you don't to. take risk, I mean, first your life will be so bored because every day is the same thing. Yeah. And but if you take risk, you learn. If you fail, it's never bad because you learn from your experience. Yeah. If you I mean if you learn how to ride a bicycle, you have to fall off. That's yes, the only way absolutely. to learn, right? So yeah. Thank you, Mackie. What a splendid and enjoyable talk with you. Thank you. I had a lot of fun, right? You get, need more courage, more confidence coming, into the women. I'm, I'm coming to ask you for the art business advice. Yes. <laughs> it will be that. interesting.